Success is a multi-dimensional word. The success, in, success is supposed to be in different areas of your life. And the, the biggest part of the success of your life is really how you as a person evolved. After all, we are going through experiences. Money is just a measurement for, for, for success. But it's not absolute measurement because it's, a, it's, it's, it's all about the experiences you go in life and how you really translate it to improving yourself as a person at the end of the day. We don't take the money with us. We don't take the buildings with us. We take the experiences and what we had done and what we, how we impacted the world with us. We take the experiences and the memories with us. So all these things, what we're doing, all this success, so-called, and you know, money is money and it's very nice. And me in my position that I have money, I can always say that it's not everything. Yes, it is. But it's not everything, 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 especially after you get to a certain level of wealth. Okay, so of course, so I came here and my first, my first goal was to secure my, my existence, my financial existence, my family existence and, and do the right thing because I grew up in a poor neighborhood and, and for a poor family and I needed to, to come and take charge. And as a kid, I promised myself doing, that, uh, doing so. And I went on a journey, you know, the whole, my whole life was a journey when, since I was a kid, I was an achiever, I was, wanted to do better, I grew up in a bad neighborhood, but I overcome, overcome the idea of where I was born into, going to high school, that the uh, integration kids and what comes with it and the issues come with it, but I always was an achiever. So I've done many, many things in my life. And I experience this variety of, you know, it's not. A, and through the business, many times you experience life, okay? So if you talk about the businesses, I can discuss with you. So, I've, so I came here and I started with, with nothing. And I ended up with a van because the guy cheated me and ended up uh, activating this van to, be, to build a moving company, the biggest moving company in New York. And from there, it was a whole journey that, took on. And at one point, a reporter asked me, what do, you, do, what do you attribute your success? I said, some people succeed because of desperation, some people because, because of inspiration. I had both. I couldn't go get a regular job because I came as a dishwasher. So once I saw the success of it, then I needed to do what I needed to do. I needed to fight my way through, and it was got into very problematic industry. It was a mafia-dominated industry. Some people didn't like it. Didn't deter me, I continued shooting and threatening and what's not. This is something else we're gonna explain one day. And at the end of the day, I ended up building a logistic business, the largest moving company in New York, and then I moved on to others, document management, real estate, fashion services, art services, technology investment. It was the, it wasn't the money, it was the challenge and the, and, and, and the need to do and the need to prove yourself all the time. Because I don't know anything else but doing, proving myself through action. You know, that's the way I get my recognition of myself, you know. I've been conditioned since I was a kid, I'm as good as what I do, you know. But over the years, this is a, many times I see people that achieve their goals in life and they get to a certain age they do not know how to evolve and they do not know how to, to, to turn their goals into a purpose, into a legacy sometime. And I was lucky enough to understand the issues because I like to read, I like to think, I like to study. And I totally understood that every kid, I think, at the end of the day, when he comes to this world, he wants to do something different. So I didn't lose this, I, this taste or this thought or this desire to do something special, to impact the world, you know. So I totally understood that the way we are going, it's not sustainable. We can't continue like this. The industrial revolution created a lot of damages in our lifetime, you know. We used to live in communities. We share amenities. We got our, our uh, protection from the neighborhood. Was more, we, were, we were more respect to each other and if we, less cheating because if we cheat, 
we had to leave the neighborhood, we couldn't live in the neighborhood. So as the Industrial Revolution came in, our life, the ecosystem, broke down to pieces. The family broke down. We went to, into city and we lived by our, by our own home, our own car, our own office. We buy everything in, just for us, the only the group. So we became like very isolated, lonely, you call it, or, or, or like each one for himself. And by the way, that's, that's also led to First World War, Second World War, and the youth movement, and harnessing the youth movement, and so forth. It's, and, and now we're going through another revolution, and hopefully we're not going to have the same issues. That uh, we, I mean, we're not, we're not, we would know how to tackle the issues. The last 20 years, we went back to communities. We went to digital communities. We had Facebook for social, and we had Amazon for purchasing. I totally understood that the neighborhood that I grew up in, when I go to the city, doesn't exist. And when we try to build a neighborhood like this, as soon as it become cool, then the hedge fund come and cannibalize the neighborhood. They get the tenant out and they pull triple A tenant. They get the restaurants out, they pull triple A, you know, retail. So you find yourself moving to another neighborhood, another, another neighborhood. So it happened in New York and several places, in Miami and many other cities. I totally understood that we need to do something different. We need to build a physical and digital neighborhood. And I think this can, uh, can impact um, uh, people's life, create opportunities for others. And this is in a way giving back for all what I got from people that helped me throughout my, work, throughout my life. So building these uh, neighborhoods is really I'm trying to get away from the idea of landlord-tenant relationship. Because it's a very vertical relationship. And the investment is vertical. This is the post-industrial revolution. Same thing with technology, fashion, art, and everything vertical. So I said we could do it horizontal investment. Where not only on the building, I can be partners in the businesses coming in. So this way I encourage businesses. So I invest in the technology companies, I invest in the art services, create art services necessary. Answer they need not compound the problem. Same thing with the fashion. Answer they need not compound the problem. What are the needs and how you can really help emerging art, uh, fashion designers, emerging, uh, emerging artists. Partner with the restaurant, partner with the bar and so forth. So this is an overall philosophy that led me in the last 12 years. As a result, I built the biggest art center in Jersey City. By the way, I was the one to start the whole meatpacking in New York City and ended up Again, the whole neighborhood changed a few times already and stores now are standing there empty. And this is with Milk Studios. That's where we started the old lady of Milk Studios. So, and then I built the biggest art center, two million square feet of abandoned warehouses, became art center and it's really cool and it's rewarding. And every time I go there, I enjoy, I enjoy my, my creation. I, course, I enjoy the impact that I've done on all these artists and people live there. And uh, as I told you, you don't measure it only with, only with money. So when I came to Miami, Miami represented a whole different set of issues. I totally understood it, that Miami need desperately help. Desperately. When was that? What year? This was 2009, the midst of the recession. And because I've been going to Miami for a long time, I've seen Miami and, you know, and nothing hurt me more when people come to me and ask me, Moshe, do you have a job for me? And I know they went to school, they finished up of the school, they have a lot of energy, they want to give, but there's nobody to take. There's nobody to say, okay, give it back, nobody to try and make it bigger, and nobody to manifest this need. So I went to Wynwood by incident and 
I fell in love with the area. It was an abandoned area. And I said, here we will build the cultural hub of Miami that Miami needed, sustainable cultural hub. Today we're fighting to keep it as such, because as, we, as usual, the residential developer coming in and the demand, they have different demands, and we're fighting it. And, but I, we have 45 acres, so I can always do what I need to do within this acreage that I have and create my own city there and not buckling to the, to the needs of the developers to build residential. I don't understand why they cannot go a few blocks away. The vision is to build business and entertainment hubs sustainable that stay there and don't change. It can be that every time the neighborhood, you go from one neighborhood to the next, to the third, to the fourth, can be. So I started buying all this land and buildings and put together and I needed to borrow money from friends. It was a recession. I lost my cash in the stock market. I had businesses though. So I was lucky enough, I was able to maneuver it and put together 45 acres together. And the idea was to build the cultural hub of Miami in Winwood. For that purpose, we did music event. It cost me, every music event cost me 200, 300,000, 350,000. Art events, one of them cost me a million dollars, was considered in Miami Herald, the cream of the cup. Mana Contemporary, Mana Contemporary was one of the events. We did the fashion shows. We did whatever it takes, you know. We brought people to party, I mean, to do events for free. Come. And we were able to get this ecosystem ignited. There was some beginning there, but we really came and we, we made it like exp explosive. So at the same time, I understood that there's so much you could build and you could do coffee shops and galleries, but need business. So, but I understood that, that uh, a business used to be, do, B2B business used to be um, physical. All of a sudden, post the industrial, post the digital revolution, everybody went digital, forgot the physical. But I understood we need physical, we need to do business to business. So I found out all these people flying, importers flying to China, flying to Korea, flying to Vietnam, to bring one container. I said, they don't need to do so. We can build a center here, showrooms, banking, and legal, and we do it digital, digital and physical, of course. And we give them the guarantees they need. That's the vision that led me to create a 10 million square foot global trade hub and the, in order to facilitate the trade between the Far East, Latin America, North America. And uh, our beloved President Donald Trump, I despise him. Not because he blew up what we did and what we were trying to do, because what he tried to do to the world, to America. Because the issues of the world, the problems that we have in the world are global and not local. Global warming, cyber, human engineering, oceans, hunger, terrorism, cyber, it's all global. So trying to isolate America, this was a big mistake. And it's very much against our philosophy, against everything what we're building and what we're doing. So we're working with the Far East, we're working with other countries, and, and uh, he, for now, he, okay, it, it stopped, it's fine, but we'll continue. We will continue with our business plan. It's just gonna take a little bit more time to do it. So as I got to really understand more what we are doing. Totally, it, it, it really understood it more and more about Miami and why Miami and what can Miami be. For the last 100 years, Miami had no vision since Henry Flagler. And in between was Maurice Ferrer, they come with the idea to make it the capital of Latin America, and he really put the idea there. But for the last hundred years, we rolled without a business plan, without initiative. And I asked myself many times, why? Why not? Why not? I couldn't find an answer. Yeah. The only answer I can give because nobody initiated it. 
Nobody tried it. So it was to be a tourist destination and logistic hub. That's it. So looking at Miami on the map, it's two, three hours from Latin America, two, three hours from North America. It has amazing ports, great ports, airport. 50 million goes to the ports, 20 million visitors, great weather, very diversified community, great taxation. Um, what else? Across the Panama Canal, and there's many other reasons, and, em and empty spaces, and it's cheap. One of the cheapest cities, I think, in the world for where, we, where we, we're standing, and so much availability of land and ability to, to build stuff that's cool. So I totally understood that the future would be Miami 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And as I was working with uh, Latin America, and traveling Latin America, understood the issues of Latin America. It's very fragmented. It's not collaborative. And each economy works by itself. So the world has a problem connecting to Latin America, and Latin America connected to the world because each country works by itself. So imagine a country like China, one and a half billion, dealing with 20 million people, or 50 million like Colombia. It's not enough rewarding. So it's very hard for them to deal with every country by itself. The technology companies that I visited, they're working in their own little hubs or their own offices that they chances to get investors from the outside slim to none because it's local. Same thing when finally they get to go to Silicon Valley, they put them in a back room. No, no, they didn't take them seriously. But if you put it together, it's 700 million people. If you put it together, it's 1.1 billion people with North America. So if America want to compete in the future markets, they better realize that the future is Latin America and put resources and funding into Latin America, and they will eventually. They will. That's the way America can compete in the world. So what I said, we're going to build a technology hub, and we need to build the, the infrastructure of the Latin America technology for Miami. For that purpose, I went to Flagler Street, Flagler District, and I bought between 60 and soon to be 70 almost buildings, properties together, to create this tech center. I call it the economic engine of Miami. And along with it, bring the fashion, bring the art, bring the entertainment, Community. answer the needs for the fashion designer, and it doesn't matter whether they are in France, or, or they're sitting in England, or they're sitting in Korea, or they're sitting in Latin America, build for them the facilities that they can really afford and can reach the people and the services they need. So we are answering this need, and answering, we have good answers, cheap, affordable, and possible for the small designers, medium design companies to show, the start, to show what they do in the United States, not only in uh, Miami, it's part of bundling of services uh, that, that, that we intend to do. So, so really understanding what Miami can be and should be, this is very much early on today. And I think anybody coming here he is really having 1.1 billion people economy, not 300 million economy of the U.S. And Latin America is the future economy because I call it the invisible continent, the invisible people. But meanwhile, they're sitting on the last land reserve left on the planet without going through the Industrial Revolution. So the opportunities agriculture and others is humongous. And the, the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to have huge food issues due to the global warming. And three and a half billion middle class you're going to see in the Far East joining the market and asking better food. I think Latin America can provide it, and this is part of our mission. So our mission is connecting Miami to Latin America through 
Miami and Panama create the Panama Miami Western Hemisphere Global Hub. For that, I reached the president of Panama, and we're going to work together, Miami Panama platform. But this is I'm talking to you like Bugs Siga talking to you about Vegas or Walt Disney talking to you about Walt Disney in the future. Walt Disney didn't know how big it's going to be, maybe, but I know how big it can be due to the fact that I've done and I can understand where it can go. Maybe they did understand where it's going to go, you know, but it's a long road ahead. So the idea is we're going to bring the school, working with schools, working with other countries to bring them into one ecosystem to work together in Miami. So we're talking about Europe, we're talking about Latin America, we're talking about the Far East. Big emphasis on Israel, bringing Israel technology. It's Israel startups to downtown Miami, create the culinary experience with it. But what's more important, that, that again I keep important saying it, that I'm, I'm providing to the world, I'm providing, I'm bringing here a new kind of platform, sustainable platform, lasting platform. The building that I'm buying, it's not for condoing, it's not for manipulation, it's not for, for, for anything but creating economy. And we, our reward as investors is from the economy that created within this neighborhood. Therefore, connecting the neighborhood to an app and capitalizing on the production and capitalizing on the consumption, this is something, big part of what we do. It's not about the building, it's about the community. So when I go to investors and I try to bring investors on board, until now it's all my money because many people, and this is one of my frustration, they don't understand this horizontal investment and they don't have money allocated for horizontal investment because they like to put it in a box. And when they ask me, I want to do two, three buildings or five buildings or one neighborhood, I tell them, listen, I bake the cake here. You're asking me for dough, you're asking me for sugar, go buy dough, go buy sugar, you don't need me. It's a cake. So building this neighborhood, collaborative neighborhoods, I think this is something that can work. It's going to be sustainable. The vision is to connect neighborhoods throughout the world. And at the end of the day, I say that peace will come through the neighborhood, not through the government or the cities. So getting people on one platform, discussing fashion, art, entertainment, food, and not also targeting as individuals, is different. Live, work, play. That's the platform. Take the car out of the equation. Put more time uh, in, into your home, into your family, into your friends. Because the car, that's why I figured New York is not going to work out in the long run. Because this business of going one, one and a half hours into the center of a city, getting into a human trap building, I call it human trap, is not sustainable. Not only this, and then go back home after 12 hours and then try to go out. Not possible. Become much more complicated and much more expensive. And the demand of work is much get bigger, uh, getting bigger even. So I grew up in a neighborhood where my mother used to have her own, work, her own uh, uh, brokerage company. The office was across the street. She walked there, she did work, and then she came back to see us if we, if we ate enough, if we are... Uh, did the homework or whatever, you know, she needed to come check on us. Then we make the work and then we went back and forth. When my father bought grapes, I bought it in, in a big box and we divided it among the neighbors. So I think bringing this platform back to the world and connecting the neighborhoods and teaching the investors to think more holistically, I think something that I can bring to this world and help. I call it the mana 4C. 4C, the letter C. Collaboration, connection, communication, and compassion. Compassion is very important because we've been conditioned for the last 100 years since the Industrial Revolution to compete fiercely and break the rules, break the law, and cheat and lie many times. The beginning of the century, I always say, it was Nikola Tesla that was cheated by Edison and J.P. Morgan. They took away from him everything. They put him, poor men on the street. This was the beginning of this century. It started like that. Politics was involved and, and cheating and lying and deceiving and greed. They gave him no room. 
and got compounded over the years with Microsoft. I buy you or you buy, or I kill you. Or if I cannot kill you, I buy you out and shut you down. But now we went into collaboration over the last 20 years. And your value to the network that you built in your life and the relationship that you built for the company, the connection that you have, the ability to communicate your product, to communicate to others. And we must add the idea of compassion. We can without it because otherwise we will go to savagery. We become savages. So we have to develop this element. It's very difficult to, to teach it, to educate it, but at one point we need to start doing it. Now, now we're facing another, you know, I always say Hitler discovered the media and the, and, and, and the microphone, the radio, and Trump discovered the social media. This is another, another kind of problems that we're having today. And we're going through a whole, a whole transformation of this social media and how to use this social media and how to harness human anger and how it's much easier to harness human anger than, than harness love. Human anger exists within us much stronger and it's much easier to resort to it. So this is something that we do that I hope that we can tackle in our neighborhoods and this is need uh, treatment as such. And uh, I know I don't want to sound bombastic and if it can happen, if we can do, and if we can make it happen, bring this teaching and education where you can develop your consciousness, awareness, morals a little bit, get more aware, because they teach us in school how material, but they don't teach us how to be better people. And I don't want to sound bombastic, and I really, like I'm saying with almost apology, but if we can have it as part, this is part of the compassion, if we can have it part of the neighborhood that we develop, as philosophy of us as investors, okay, that we, we, we we're the first one to really, to act upon it, and then get others to understand the issues. We need to learn it. You need to develop it within yourself. Our vision is regardless Trump, no Trump, and, and we need to do it much more. I'm convinced that we need to do it in order to avoid a situation like this again. So a, a, I can tell you it started already now. I can tell you when it started, it already started. The vision is there, the philosophy is there, the buildings are there, the, the people already that within our organization totally committed to make it happen. Mm -hmm. The community getting more and more aware of it. I made the finance available for this. I can tell you it started, but I can tell you it would never end because it's, it's exponential. It's like you're asking Walt Disney, when is your project going to end? But he did for entertainment, we're doing for business. I think that many businesses and many countries are going to understand the importance of having ecosystem, sustainable ecosystem. This is necessary with every country and every state to create this neighborhood that can be the driver of the city. We did it in Jersey City, we did it here, we're doing it in South of Chicago, and we're gonna do it in many other cities. In the past, people used to call Miami the suburb of New York. Nothing got me more angry than that. Because Miami is not a suburb, it's a city. I compare Miami to the little sister of New York that now is getting noticed, getting mature, and it's becoming sexy. And the world starts really looking at Miami. So we're getting so much feedback from so many countries and so many places and so many businesses. Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, Israel, Latin America, Europe, I, the island, Central America, all looking into Miami. Now everybody discovered Miami. And we are now on the road already. Nothing can stop Miami from growing. We're still in the early, in the early stages but the train is moving, it started moving. Okay, so I recommend other jump on the plane, uh, on, on, on the train. 
It's a good train to ride. Join us. We are now building the Nikola Tesla Innovation Hub. And uh, this is a center around the healthcare industry and innovative healthcare me methodologies and innovations. Nikola Tesla said that the secret of the world is vibration, sound, or frequency. This is the secret that we held, by the way. And there's a company called Inside Tech that does treatment for brain, for brain cancer, uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer's, prostate. They do treatment based on this technology. It's a unicorn company. They are moving into the ecosystem. We are looking for many other innovative uh, companies, startup or businesses that already uh, have other solutions that what we that what we know about bringing it into this center. I'm very excited about it. I'm very excited the design that we're going to have. This is something going to be a game changer for downtown. We are building the international spice market that uh, was in spices from over the world with chef community, with culinary school, with pop up kitchen, with food lab. FIU food lab going to be there. Rooftop, food stations. This is something very super exciting. The fashion, and answering the fashion issues, smaller stores, collaborative uh, resources of services, of labor and logistic and everything come with it. Making it on a monthly basis, uh, nothing uh, committing for wholesale and for the community. Combined with arts, smaller galleries also combined with food and entertainment and making it fun for people to come and, and experience new fashion. And uh, this is something I look forward to make this happen. We're still building it, we're still developing the concept, but we're very there, we got a great concept coming up for the fashion industry and how to help the, the design companies to become uh, more successful. Technology, creating the synergies, creating the the, the station F of Paris, creating here in Flagler Station. Both of them start with F, by the way. And uh, bringing ad many countries to work from the same building. Latin America with the Far East, with the Middle East and collaborative. And build the building accordingly, that it's more collaborative and not something separate of flows. This is something going to be also very impactful on Miami. And of course, we, get, we have many others for the community here that we're working on and with the legal community and everything else that we are doing. So we're about providing answers to problems with, our, with what we're doing, with our buildings, with our ecosystem. I'm friends with both mayors. They're both amazing and great. And they're doing whatever within their power to do to make this thing happen. They are totally committed for the vision. They are totally committed to what we do. They are totally committed for Miami, for the greater Miami. So our job to support them with their efforts is not only us, because it's very important for us that the entire Miami will be great. So with the, we work with them direct on issues. Of course, there's issues always to, to do and to improve budgets. My goal is to find more pockets within the county, state, and federal to, to, to finance what we do and enhance businesses that are coming into our ecosystem, put the budget for that. So we're still in process working with the government, and, but they're really doing their best. I mean, people, every time, you know, that's what I learned. When people learn about what we do, they all want to help. They all want to be part of it. They all part. They, they they feel it's a part of of something substantial. Yeah. And I can tell you again, I'm doing my best. I put my money where my mouth is. I I I I follow this philosophy. And if it works, it works. It doesn't. It doesn't. But I think it's going to work, and it's working already. So I'm doing my best effort to come with good intention to do the right thing by the community. It, it's in full force. 
There's no day that I don't meet with, with technology company or with fashion or with arts or, or, or with agriculture or, or with the VCs, banking, anything. There's no day goes by that I don't meet any of these issues and tackling it and coming with creative ideas, creative solution, working with creative architects you know, to make something that is really impactful and different. And I'm looking forward to see part of the vision in my lifetime. This, uh, uh, the design of the office, how it should be. What is the office functionality is going to be, you know? So we see the office becoming like, you build like you know, a house, like, like you call it residential commercial. You got a kitchen in your office, you got couches, you got collaborative, because it's more of a meeting place the office become. Okay, so you can do work at home. You can do work at the office. The hard lifting work that need this, this, this office, traditional office space, mm -hmm. not in the city. It can go other areas. It can go to the inner cities to give them the jobs. It can go also Latin America for all I'm concerned. I mean, companies will realize it eventually that, and more and more companies are going to move back offices to different parts of the country and take it away from the center. So I always say the home is part of your office or the office part of your home and both part of the public spaces that you have. And uh, this philosophy of uh, live, work, play enhance more the idea of, 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 of working together, taking care of each other together, that building walls is not going to stop viruses. We're all connected and we all should be responsible for each other. And the success of someone else is my success. And if somebody else is sick, it's my sickness. So these kind of ideas I think we can uh, really hope to, 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 to be part of, I know many people are doing it. I mean, there is a movement for and a movement against. So we are part of this movement for. Once it's holistic, then everybody will, will win. I'm a capitalist, but not a pig, okay? When when you go to, to the philosophy of different economists, Milton back then in the 70s, 80s, where he claimed that corporations must make only money and are responsible for money and make as much money no matter with no concern for the impact they do on the I mean, surrounding. I'm very much against it. So yes, you're supposed to make money, but you're also supposed to be responsible for your surrounding, for your environment. So it has to be a responsible capitalism. It can be one getting everything and the other one is getting nothing because we're gonna end up in a jungle. We're gonna end up in civil wars. So I believe in capitalism, but not a piggish capitalism. And if I have to pay a few more percentage taxes, it's fine. If that's what pay for the school, for the health, for the roads and so forth and not to be afraid of it and not to be selfish for the most many times some of the rich people not to be selfish about it they have to think about others as well closing your door doesn't make your home safe and throwing your garbage through the windows doesn't make your home clean and we really have to understand it